All right, welcome. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's still morning, right? Okay, fantastic. So um, this talk is Scaling Agile, a Guide for the Perplexed. Uh, that basically means what? Who's perplexed? I need to hear somebody. Confused? Need some, you know, something to uh, look beyond the basics. So what we're going to do is to peel back this topic of scaling agile. You've heard, you just finished uh, hearing from Scott Ambler, who has the Disciplined Agile Delivery Framework. I see the folks from the Scaled Agile Academy over here. And we have these different frameworks for scaling. And what we need to do is to figure out a path that will allow us to build a foundation for scaling. If you're doing team-based agile, how can we start to go beyond a few teams, multiple teams, to several teams together, maybe several projects, several programs, and maybe on, even on to a portfolio and such. So um, a few words of introduction to myself. I've been in this field, in the agile space, for 16 years. The 26, did I do something? Okay. 2016 was the 16th year of uh, um, my agile journey, and over the last few years, it's been increasingly concentrated in the space of taking Agile beyond the team to business agility, if you will, and also to helping organizations scale Agile. So um, without further ado, I'd also like to find out more about who's here in the audience today. So let's quickly self-assess on a scale of one, two, and three. If you have been doing Agile for, if you've been doing Agile for six months or less, Let's count that as a newbie, like level one, you know, novice level. So let's see the hand, show of hands. Who are the level ones? Any level ones, few level ones, okay. Level two, six to eight, 18 months. You know, six months to about a year and a half. You've done a few projects, that's an intermediate level. That's uh, level two, who are the level twos? Fantastic, and level threes, everybody else, all the experts in the room. So <clears throat> it looks like we have our even distribution between the level ones and twos and threes. So I'm gonna have to, um, massage my talk and make sure that I cover a few of the basics, some stuff for the intermediate and definitely some things for the uh, experts among you as well. So let's start with some of the basics. You guys know, the twos and threes, the intermediate and the experts know that agile is not just one method. Right? It's, a, it's a term that applies to many team-based agile methodologies. You see some of them on, on that chart, extreme programming or XP for short, Scrum, Kanban, and now you're uh, in older, in, uh, further along in, in the way, we used to see things like feature de development and such. Um, this particular survey, the State of Agile Development Survey, has shown us that uh, even today, at the team-based level, Scrum continues to be the predominant methodology. So you've been looking at about 52% or so. More recently, the question has become, how do we take team-based Agile with Scrum or with Kanban or with some hybrid thereof, like Scrumban maybe, and scale it? And so we've seen scale, the emergence of scaling frameworks like the Disciplined Agile Delivery as Framework, Scaled Agile Academy, uh, Scaled Agile, and also Scrum and Scale and such. So we're gonna have to talk about how to make uh, a path for de demystifying some of these, right? So here's our agenda today. We're gonna, we have about an hour, 55 minutes or so. I want this session to be interactive. So at the beginning, I let you off when you didn't answer a question, but as we go along, I'm gonna have to ask questions and I'm gonna stay quiet till you answer. Is that okay? So I, I have to ask you one question to test this out. Does everybody, everybody have a conference bag? Yes, put your hands up if you have a conference bag. All right, very good. I want you to open that conference bag and look for a book that says, Scaling Agile, a Lean Jumpstart, and hold it up in the air. You might not have realized it's there. Not the uh, happiness one, though that's also a good uh, freebie that you can take. And if you don't, there you go, hold it up in the air. So, so this book that you already have in your bag is gonna form the basis of what we're gonna talk about today. So don't fret if you don't see the slides or you don't wanna keep up with the slides and such. In that book, you'll have everything that I'm talking about today. Does that look good? Everyone? So let's ask the question. Everyone got the bag? Everyone got the book? Okay, fantastic, we're in good shape. So our agenda is, why should we scale? Let's answer that question first. Why should we scale? We have team-based methods. We're doing agile, you know, maybe Scrum, and it's successful. Why should we scale? Right? Uh, it, 
we shouldn't be looking at scaling agile methods for its own sake. Let's figure out what is the business rationale for scaling methods. Once we can establish that, then we have to say, well, how can I jumpstart in my organization? How can I get ready? How can I move forward very quickly um, with scaling agile? Right? And I'm going to present to you an overview of, a, of such an approach, which is also captured in the book, and also an iterative scaling method or an approach, if you will, to scaling that has three, these three components, assess, align, and accelerate. Okay? And then we'll look at reflecting and progressing, and then I'll leave you with a summary and next steps. How does that sound for a plan? Good, okay, very good. So let's move on. Why scale agile? It turns out that if you look at organizations, and this could be private sector organizations or public sector organizations, organizations that are able to pivot, what does pivot mean? Change direction, there you go. Organizations that are able to pivot, change direction, and implement quickly. It's not enough to just change direction, that, that's just thrashing, right? So if our organization, at the organization level, regardless of the size, regardless of the domain, if you're able to change direction and implement quickly, then we can achieve competitive advantage. Would you say, would you say that's a good thing, right? In fact, long-term sustainability and existence of an organization is dependent on this. Can we adapt to our changing environment? Can our business, businesses and organizations keep up with the change that we know is very, you know, um, uh, very rapid in today's world? Right? So that's, that's um, something that we should look at. Then the question becomes, can agile methods help us achieve this organizational pivoting and competitive uh, delivery, if you will, execution? Right? So I want to present to you a couple of examples these are both US-based, because unfortunately I haven't been to India in the last few years. I'm sure there's several folks, including the guy in the Philips, who's talking about this. Anyone here from Philips? No Philips? They're all getting ready to talk at uh, 12.30, I think. So there are example, India-based examples. But here's an, uh, an example that is from an insurance company. Anyone here work in financial services? So example, which company, sir? Fidelity Investments. JP Morgan, yeah, that's right, you guys are title sponsors, right? Uh, it's a good conference for you? Okay, very good. So, uh, who thinks that financial services is sexy? Put your hands up, yeah. You, you have to keep your job, right? <laughs> so, you know, who thinks that Google is sexy? Only one or two people? Yes. Who thinks that, you know, uh, who are these guys? Uber is sexy, right? So, we, we tend to associate, um, sexiness, you know, organizational sexiness or ex exec delivery of an execution with the product development companies. But here, I'm gonna present you a relatively, in general opinion, unsexy company, which is an insurance company. This is nation, nationwide insurance uh, based in Columbus, Ohio in the US. And they have gone through a transformation for the last six or seven years. And here are some of the results. Right? Uh, last year, they had a program of 27 teams and the 27 teams working together under a lean and agile framework were able to execute, deliver value to their customers for seven months without a single severity one defect in production. Right? Now what does that buy you? That, that says that they have very high quality. Right? And high quality, as Deming said, equals high speed. There's no way that we can go fast, there's no way we can execute quickly or pivot unless we have high quality. So these guys have been able to implement agile now on 140 teams, 140 teams enterprise-wide, and it is delivering an amazing amount of organizational agility. Now here, uh, that's one example. Here's another example. This one is also another unsexy type domain, and this one is with the government, again, the US federal government. Now we, we're all used to complaining about the government. Who thinks your government is doing a good job? Who thinks the government is horrible? Oh, you're New Zealand. You better have a small country, right? any big country. Okay, so your, your, your government is doing a good job, Australia? Okay, okay. <laughs> All right, the second question. Who thinks the government is horrible and not doing a good job? Just a few people? Okay. Other people don't understand the question? <laughs> All right. So it's, it's fashionable to complain about government. Right? It's fashionable to say, well, the government uh, doesn't deliver my services, they use my tax dollars. Um, it's interesting that in the last few years, the US federal government has started adopting Agile. Now, is it a 
is, a, is it a blanket solution to all the problems? Not at all. But there are two things that I can call out. One, a few years ago, there was the first ever federal CIO. This is the executive level position created by President Obama and his cabinet. And his name was Vivek Kundra. And he put together something called the 25-point program. And there were essentially two pillars to that 25-point program. One was a large-scale consolidation and movement to the cloud, infrastructure moving to the cloud. Right? That reduces a lot of waste, redundancy, and that kind of stuff. And the other pillar within the federal government that started a, a series of events in the federal government was something that he called iterative and incremental delivery. Right? Now, that's just code for agile. Right? So he didn't use the word agile, but he called it iterative and incremental delivery. And here are some of the results. I mean, this is about four years ago, $3 billion reduction in life cycle budget reduction. This is in the federal government. If the government can do this, then certainly all of us in the private sector should be able to do much better. Because in the government, they have a lot of constraints that we don't. Now, another one, you see that picture over there. This, that, the picture over there is a very sensitive national organization. It's called NGA, the National, national Geospatial Intelligence Agency. And those folks are scaling using the Scaled Agile framework. And they have used agile methods to deliver organizational agility. It's not just IT. IT is just a small part of what they do. They, they are uh, you know, national intelligence agencies, so we can't talk about too much about what they're doing. But this is public knowledge. You can go on online, and you can look at how they, you know, a few elements of how they've used Agile to achieve organizational agility. So no, we know it can be done. Right? The question is, what is different between these organizations, the nationwide of the world, the NGAs, or other organizations who are like folks represented here, uh, Philips and such, and other organizations that are struggling to scale their adoptions from a few teams to multiple teams. So we have to look and see what are some of the barriers to agile adoption. This particular survey, again, shows us that the number one barrier to agile adoption, once you have agile working on a team, let's say you've got one scrum team and you want to roll it out on five teams or a little you know, further uh, beyond that, the number one barrier to adoption is the ability to change organizational culture. Right? And this, this particular survey, this is from 2015, this particular survey has been done every year for the past 10 years, I think. And every year, the number one barrier to adoption has remained the same. It's the ability to change organizational culture. So we say, OK, that sounds simple, but at the same time complex. What does it mean? to be able to change our organizational culture. So let me ask you guys a question. Has anybody here, and I'm actually, I shouldn't say anybody, I'm sure some of you have heard of something called Conway's Rule. Who knows what Conway's Rule is? Tell us what Conway's Rule is. Or the structure of the code reflects the structure of the organization. Or if you take another perspective, the process that we have will find a mirror or will create a mirror structure in our organization. If I have a waterfall process, how long have we had a waterfall process? Since 1974. 40, 50 years of waterfall have created a siloed organization. Right? So it's all fine and well for us to talk about cross-functional teams. But what remains is a siloed organization on top of our agile teams. Right, so if you look at the slide over here, we got some agile teams. Who has a team that looks like this? Cool, you know, everybody's there. You got a scrum master, you got uh, developers, you got testers. We call this a cross-functional or an integrated team. Who has a cross-functional or integrated team? Let's see a show of hands here. What methods are you using? Is it Scrum, XP, Kanban? Scrum. scrum. You got a scrum master? Are you a scrum master? Put your hands up if you're a scrum master. Let's give this lady, uh, the scrum master, a big hand. They got a hard job. Okay. And you have a team that looks like this? OK, very good. Now, the problem is Conway's rule is also ensuring that your large organization is a siloed organization. And there's no way for us to achieve larger scale organizational agility until we're able to change that larger fabric of the organization. Would you agree with that? OK, now, if we have a situation like this, you have development, K, QA, and operation, we see some dysfunctions. Here's a typical dysfunction. Scrum, 
how, uh, what is the team size recommended by Scrum? Five to nine people, right? So seven plus or minus two, nice little math mathematical formula over there. Who has been, put your hands up if you've been on a Scrum team of over 15 people. Put your hands up. Just a few people. Okay. You, might, you guys, what is it? So what's your Scrum, the team size of your, um, your Scrum teams over here? Yell it out. Eight people? Seven people? Awesome. Sometimes two. Well, that, that's a little too little. But anyway. So here's something that we see is that the team size tends to blow. I was working last, or not last week, last month with a, uh, with a team that had 35 people on the Scrum team. Their daily stand-up, which is supposed to be, took more like 50 minutes, almost an hour. Obviously, by the time 50 people speak and such. So teams, when, when we have an organizational in misalignment, this tends to happen. Here's another thing that will happen. Have you seen this? QA taken out from, rather than having an integrated team where we're supposed to have a developer, analyst, tester all working together, we take our QA people and we put them where? In the basement. Anybody here from QA? Nobody? Are you, where do you, where do you hang out, in the basement? No, you're integrated. Well, so this, this, maybe this doesn't apply to you guys. So uh, what we, we tend to do is that we backslide towards waterfall on occasion organizationally. And we say, oh, QA, they need to be separate. We'll put them in a basement, they'll do some stuff, and we'll send them idli vadas if they find all the, all, the, uh, all the bugs, right? Okay, here's another one. Who works on more than one project at a time? Okay. How many projects do you work on, typically? Two projects. The industry average, if you take North America and Europe, I don't know about India, is three to five projects, even when there's claim they're doing agile. That's an industry statistic that shows that people are allocated to three to five, between three and five projects, uh, not just uh, to one, the way that we're supposed to uh, have on an Agile team. And the multitasking causes what? Delays, yeah, context switching and delays. And so you guys know this, so the question is how do we fix this? So I'm gonna show you a short video, and I apologize if you saw this in my Tuesday's talk, but I promise you that even if you saw it on Tuesday, I'll give you a different slant today. The question is what do we do to make sure that our larger organization can also become agile, not just our teams, but our larger organizations. So we're gonna to look to um, John Carter, and John Carter, of course, is from Harvard Business School, and here he is talking about the 21st century organization. Hello, I'm John Carter, and I'm here to talk to you about winning in a faster and faster moving world a world where more threats are coming at us from all kinds of different unpredictable directions, but also in which there are more windows of opportunity opening and closing faster than ever. I am convinced that we've crossed a line in which the old methods that we've used to deal with this no longer work. And I wanna to talk to you briefly about what seems to work in this faster and faster moving world. To understand this, I found you need to understand how organizations naturally evolve over time and how that has gotten us to where we are now. All organizations start with a, a structure that kind of looks like a dynamic uh, solar system or a molecule. Their advantage of is that they can be very, very fast uh, very agile, they can run around existing competition. They start with a um, set of entrepreneurs. It doesn't matter if they're trying to make a new type of microchip or a new type of chocolate chip cookie. They attract people who work on various initiatives. It could be anything, uh, playing around with crazy ideas, talking to customers, uh, doing things with alloys. Um, and they can drop those initiatives and start new ones. If they're successful though, they have to be able to make and ship a product or deliver a service. And as soon as that happens, you start to see growing something that we would recognize. 
it looks more like a hierarchy. It has jobs. It has processes. And if they continue to be successful, of course, it's that part that has to grow. And it grows. And for a brief time, you've got both, both systems that tend to be hooked together well uh, because of the entrepreneurs who play a part in both. Uh, and sometimes the old timers that have jobs over at one side and they're still in that entrepreneurial system. But as successful as they are, you know what part grows and it grows. And at a certain point, it doesn't like the old entrepreneurial, unpredictable, whipping around system. And so it systematically eliminates it. And you end up with what we all know, a typical modern organization. Now, in a slow enough moving world, uh, that can work fine, and it does. But as the world starts to speed up, it doesn't. And so what smart people do is they augment it. They add uh, strategic planning committees. They hire strategic consultants. They put together interdepartmental task forces or project management organizations to first create and then to execute strategies. And if this is done well, it works up to a point. But as the world speeds up more and more, it doesn't. So they continue along this same path. It happens naturally. You add another committee, you add work streams, you add more strategy pieces. And after a while, all of this addition, addition, addition actually slows you down and the whole thing starts to sink into the muck, which obviously does not win today. It raises the question of what could win today and actually, you just saw it a minute ago. Now, let's rewind the tape. Okay, start there and go back. Go back some more. Now stop. There it is. Something that can be reliable and efficient now? Yes, we've proven it. A set of processes and procedures and methods can take you from wherever you're at and you start growing that entrepreneurial piece from the center on out in an organic way. You keep the two pieces connected in a very solid way and you end up with this mechanism that can be both uh, reliable, efficient, fast, and agile and win today. Here's the bad news. Many organizations have succeeded in doing that, about 0.001%. Really, seriously. Here's the good news. It doesn't have to be that way. Okay. So it doesn't have to be that way. So we're going to talk about how we can succeed with building oops, an organization that is both fast and efficient and, I'm sorry, reliable and efficient and um, agile at the same time. To follow a hypothetical company, let's call this company Acme Corporation. And we have some three protagonists over here. One is the CTO, the Chief Technical Officer. His name is Manish. And any Manishes in the room? No Manishes? Okay. Manish is busy. Uh, and any, uh, we have a PMO, a Program Management Office head. Think of this as a program management, uh, program op manager. Her name is Shalini. Any Shalinis in the room? No Shalinis, okay. And then this one should be, there must be at least one Raj in the room. Any Raj? No Raj, I guess we'll run out of luck. There's a Raj, yeah. Oh, Rajiv, okay, close. <laughs> okay, so Raj. And so let's give Raj a big hand, uh, hand. he's our scrum master over here. So we're, what we're gonna do is to follow Manish, Shalini, and Raj's journey through an agile transformation and outline our approach as we go. So there's Manish, there's Shalini and Naraj, and what their job from their boss, who's the CIO of the company, is to implement agile methods at a larger scale, right? So they go, they have a few agile projects going on, and they start looking at just scaling agile. And one of the things, the first thing they go out and say, okay, what's on the market? And there are different options, right? I think Scott Ambler had, uh, a t-shirt that said something about options. What did he say, did he talk about that? 
choice, yeah, choices are, choices are good. So, well, okay, they say, well, choices are good. However, if I have so many choices, it's going to be hard for me to zero in and figure out which ones to pick. So let's go out and take a look at the survey and see where can we start. Look at these are the scaling frameworks out there. This is from the version 1 2015 Agile survey. And it says that the number one technique for scaling is what? Scrum of scrums. But what is the scrum of scrums? Anybody know what a scrum of scrums is? Yes, sir, at the back. Exactly. So we have a daily scrum meeting on each individual team, and then they say, well, if I have five teams, then each one of those five teams is going to send one or two people, and we're going to aggregate that information in a regular meeting called a scrum of scrums. That's not really a framework. right? So I don't know how people put it up here, but they say, oh, 70%. We're doing scrum of scrums, so we must be awesome. If you look further down the chart, you see the scaled agile framework, you see less, you see that, and so on. Uh, so they say, okay, well, where do we start? Why don't we go out and start to deconstruct this framework into a tiered uh, diagram? So pretty much any of these frameworks, including the Scrum of Scrums, will break out into three levels, though I think the scaled agile folks are now at a fourth level above this. But you know, here you say we have some agile teams at the base level. We've got Scrum teams or an XP team or a Kanban team. And then we have the scrum of scrum teams that will aggregate the information across those teams if I want to connect across these four teams. Um, if, I want, if I have multiple teams that I need to work together, then I, I can have a program. Right? And you can see, uh, besides the, the famous methods out there with Safe, Less, Dad, and Nexus, there are also uh, the, um, industry-specific or company-specific techniques like the Spotify. Who's heard of Spotify? Yeah, you've heard of Spotify. Spotify music company. You should go check out their video. They have a. They talk about how they do agile development at their company, and they also talk about program level aggregation and results and a, a flexible organization. There's also something called the Agile PMO. I'm going to show you that later. And if I if I want to aggregate the work of multiple programs at a portfolio level, where I can make financial decisions and strategically drive my my organization then I'm looking at a narrower set of choices. I say, well, okay, now that we kind of understand that scaling frameworks have this tiered view, where can we start? Can we run an experiment? Can we do Agile or roll out Agile in an Agile fashion? So they decide to follow its iterative scaling, scale, uh, scaling strategy. Iteration means repetition. Right? So when we say iterative, we mean we repeat a few steps over and over again. If you're looking at process improvement, we implement plan, do, check, act, which is Deming's improvement cycle. For scaling, we say, let's assess, align, and accelerate. And we'll do this over and over, over again. And to do that over and over again, in, in conjunction with an iterative scaling strategy, we'll have an incremental rollout plan. So we'll keep iterating, but we'll also roll out Agile in increments. After we do an initial assessment, we'll align, we'll accelerate, we'll reflect in progress, and we can lay out a timeline. In Acme's um, case, they say, let's set out a six-month timeline for our initial pilot, another six months for the next stage, and then another you know, third six months, 18 months for the full-scale Agile rollout. Now, this is, of course, our you know, recommended approach. There are other people who try to go from step one directly to step, you know, what is this, four, and that's okay, that might work for them, but over 15, 16 years in the Agile uh, industry, I believe this is the best way to do things, right? In incrementally roll it out. You might accelerate if your organization is moving much faster. You might be able to go from here to here in six months. But following this incremental approach, I think, is the best way to mitigate your risk and to be increase your chances of success. So Acme says, okay, we're going to do this. So let's go out and assess and see how well we're doing on a few key elements. From a business perspective, if I'm looking at organizational agility, here are three metrics that we, we think are important. Time to market. Time to market look, means that how reliably am I delivering solutions from the inception into production, from concept to cash, right? So time to market. We were gonna measure that across all of it. So Acme says we're gonna take a look at that. We'll also look at cost, more standard metric, and also customer satisfaction. How satisfied are my business customers with the stuff that we're delivering, right? So they go through the initial assessment. Time to market is 
not very good. So they're not doing really badly across the, uh, compared to the con their customers, uh, their competitors. Turns out that cost is high and so is customer satisfaction, which is low. Anybody been in this situation? You, you, you have? Okay. Okay. So this is all, all, uh, sometimes a, you know, one of the reasons why we adopt agile methods, because we know that agile methods can help with this business scenario. When it's taking too long to deliver the stuff, when our customers are not happy, and it costs too much. Right? So they say, okay, uh, Acme says, and I'm going to quote one of my actual customers, he says, they say, Manish says, now we know we're bad. We're world class bad. But there's one thing good about this. What's good about this? You know. And you know there is only one direction you can go from here, hopefully, which is up. We can get better. So we're here. We know we're bad. We're going to benchmark from now. We're going to go up. All right. So we say, let's align. Let's kick off our pilot program. A pilot program is an experiment to see in the six months how we can run Agile. So at Acme, they say, let's run six months pilot program and um, establish the role of an Agile champion. Any Agile champions here? Somebody in the organization that is responsible for perpetuating and evangelizing Agile methods. Necessary role. There is money to be spent. Before we can speed up, we have to slow down. Let's slow down. We have to train our people. We have to get them to understand Agile. We have to realign a little bit. We have to establish the voice of the customer, put some product owners in place, figure out which projects we are, we're going to launch, figure out who our product owners are. Product owners are people from the business that will represent the needs of the business to our Agile teams. And then we have to figure out you know, how to take these projects and get them launched. Six months, about five projects. Acme says, let's go off and do this. Things start to turn around. As they do this, they say, well, one of the things we need to make sure is that all of these projects, just like we benchmarked our performance, we should benchmark a basic process. Different teams can experiment. They can try different tools. But we're going to have a common thread running through this, these, um, these uh, projects, the pilot projects. And here's the base, base, base project uh, process that they decide on. They'll have an initial discovery or launch. This will be about a month or so, a couple weeks. Maybe some people call this sprint zero, iteration zero. And then they'll have two week sprints. Each one of the sprints has a familiar cycle, right? So sprint planning, sprint demo, daily standups, and such. On the delivery side, we say we have automated build and test, metrics, some, re some XP practices for uh, code um, quality and stuff. And we're going to measure uh, just three or four, uh, three things, simple things, code quality, team velocity, and user story cycle time. Who knows what cycle time means? What is cycle time? Anybody? Yes, sir. The time between when a story begins in development to the time it takes us to do what? Deliver it back to the customer. So they say, well, let's get it to done, not necessarily production, but let's measure the user story cycle time and getting it done, which means coded, ready for production, shippable back to the product owner. And that's going to allow us to measure the speed at which these, company, these, these teams are going. Looks good. They got some version control tools, some technical tools. They get moving. Six months later, they say, let's look at the results. Pilot program starts to look good. Time to market is down by 70%. Cost reduction, 20%. Customer satisfaction commensurately up by 50%. Customers are happy. Product owners are getting results. Our pilot program is go looking good. Who's lived this? Anybody gone through this cycle? Just a few? Well, yeah. So I'm not making this stuff up. It happens. This is, a, this is a synthesis of about 10 or 15 years of agile adoption. All right? So next step, they say, pilot program is proved out. Things are looking good. Let's go to the next step, an expanded pilot. It's time to accelerate. We proved this out. We built a team. Let's accelerate. And in accelerating, let's look at some key scaling fundamentals. Limit work in process. Do just the minimum th amount done that will allow us to move quickly without that context switching and, and waste. Grow small, stable teams. Build a network of these teams. And then manage the flow. All right? Let's take the first one. Limit work in process. This is Bangalore, so your traffic looks worse than this. Is that correct? Who had to deal with traffic that looks worse than this picture over here coming in? All right. How often do you deal with that? Every day. And uh, what time do you start your commute? Eight-ish? Does it look like this at eight? 
Okay. And then it continues, does it get worse or better as you go through the day? What's that? Worse. So at what time of day does it not look like this? When is the traffic okay? What's that? 7.30 to 8 o'clock. Based on where, where I'm coming from, at, if I leave my house, let's say at 7 a.m., it's okay. Put your hands up if you're, you think you can go fairly smoothly on the highway if you leave your house at 7 a.m. Okay? All right. Now, if I want to avoid the traffic on the way going back, what time should I look at that? 11 p.m.? Okay. Okay. 2 p.m. 2 a.m. What's that? 2 p.m. in the afternoon. Okay, but I can't leave work at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. That's my tea time. So, what's that? 9 p.m. So put your hand up if you're 9 p.m. If you leave your office, you'll have a decent commute back. Just a few people. Some people said 11, 11 p.m. or sometimes 11. So what starts to happen is that, you know, at around 7 a.m., more and more traffic starts hitting the road, right? And why is this? Everybody's going to work, right? And the utilization of my highway goes up. And at about, what time does it get start to get really bad? 9.30, we are gone beyond the 80% threshold. And the cycle time, my, the time it takes me to go from point A to point B, has gone up exponentially. Beyond the 80% threshold, there's something called Little's Law that says once 80% or more of that highway is used, your, the time it takes you to go from point A to point B it goes up exponentially. And this is why we need a work in process limit. If we don't have this work in process limit, you just have continuous flooding of traffic on and on. And then you have, you have to wait it out till 9, 9 p.m. or 11 p.m., right? So once a highway or any shared resource, this queuing theory tells us this, on, on the top, what is the top right, there's something called Little's Law that says cycle time is a function of the amount of work in process, whether it's cars in the highway or projects in the portfolio or user stories in, a, in your project. Right? If I have too many user stories and I'm working on too much stuff, it's, taking, it's going to take too long. My cycle time is going to long. If I have too many projects, then the delivery of individual's projects will go, you know, the cycle time will go up exponentially, just like my traffic on the highway. Does that make sense? So what's the answer? If I want to speed up, I, got, I have a numerator and I have a denominator. If I want that cycle time to go down, what do I need to do? Pardon? Either I need to reduce the work in process, reduce the numerator, or increase the completion rate. If I have a team, increasing the completion rate means making the team go faster. How much faster can I make the team go? Not much. I can, what can I do to make my teams go faster? What's that? Whip them? Shout at them. Yell at them. The beatings will continue till the morale improves. Right? So, sh so I can either do that, which doesn't work too well, or incentivize. Like what? Free trip to Thailand. Anybody get a free trip to Thailand? Nobody. OK, other incentives. Yeah, those, those short-term motivations don't work. So really, the only realistic, pragmatic uh, option I have is to reduce my work in process. And I'll prove to you that it works right, in a second. So let's say at Acme, they say, these are the things that we're going to do. Anything that's a sick project. What's a sick, pro sick project? A sick project is, is one that's taking long, is going on forever and ever in, in the US, but there's a whole sort of zombie ap apocalypse. right? So this is like a. Uh, a Vikram and Betal kind of thing situation. That thing just keeps coming back. You can, just, you can never get rid of it, right? So this is a, this is a zombie project, right? And um, there's only one way to, I, I can get my portfolio to move faster, is to get rid of the project, right? Take large projects and break them down into smaller ones, and then prioritize what's left. Simple steps. They're simple in theory, but they're very hard to implement in practice. Why? Why is this hard to implement in practice? If I say, here's a project, it's not doing good, if we've been spending all this money, we need to kill this project. Somebody's career is linked to that, is usually the pet project of some really you know, uh, high-priced high executive, 
and it's their pet project, so it's really hard to do this unless you have a systematic project to do this. So Acme says, we're gonna crack some eggs and make some omelets, we wanna make sure that these things uh, are perpetuated in the organization, we'll set up a portfolio management committee, they go through these steps, terminate the six projects, split large projects into small ones, prioritize them, and limit the delivery framework to, to months. They end up with a portfolio that looks like this. Before, they had an unprioritized portfolio with 400 projects in, in flight. Once they prioritize the por portfolio, only 100 projects are in work in process. They're one fourth. They've killed 100 projects, and they've queued up 100, and the backlog of projects is 100, all right? Now, look on the top uh, right again, seems to it. Who's heard of this odd even scheme? Anybody heard of odd even schemes? Tell us how it works in New Delhi. Anybody from New Delhi here? Nobody? You know of that, okay. So what is the odd even scheme? I think they're just, uh, they're gonna restart it in April, right? So is it your number plate and the date? So it's, a, it's my registration um, number, if it happens to be odd, yeah, and the date is odd, then I can try it. Okay, is this just a weird Kejriwal scheme or did it work? What do you think? What's that, the first one is it? So apparently there's some, some benefit to the scheme, right? If you go and look at the results, look at the, you know, even if you account for traffic limits, right, tra speed limits at, in New Delhi, the, the speed, average speed, and this is from Uber Delhi, uh, went up on average by statistically significant 5.4%, right? This means by reducing the amount of traffic on the highway, cars went faster. And it wasn't just casual, okay? So it's a good, good scheme, they prove it. This is why they're gonna reinstate it again in April. All right, so if you go to, if you go to Delhi in April, we'll have the odd even scheme back in existence. Does that make sense? Okay. So rebalancing the portfolio can have amazing results, even, you know, even when you deal with a mass metro system like this with such complexities as New Delhi, okay? So that's our work in process uh, limit section. The next thing we have to do is to grow small, stable teams. So rather than bringing teams together, putting projects together, and then breaking them up, and going through um, what we call the Tuckman model of team formation. Any PMPs here, project management professionals? Yes, sir, let's give him a big hand. He's a brave man. Yeah. So in the PMP, in the PMBOK, the project management body of knowledge, they talk about the cycle that a team has to go through. And that cycle is forming, storming, norming, and performing. You're a PMP as well? No, okay, he just happens to know. Let's give him a big hand as well. So this is team formation. We form a team, they have to storm, they have to work out procedures. Then they norm, they start to get working together, and then and only then can they become high performing. And my question to you is, if we have to do this every time a, a team comes together, why do we break the team up again once they're high performing? And so what our goal should be is to create stable teams. And rather than bringing people to the work, we should bring the work to the team. Right, that backlog that you saw, that 100 people uh, project backlog, this is what it's looking like. Here's the stuff that's in flight, here's what's queued, and here's in the backlog. And here you have three teams, these are standing teams, some people call them standing teams, some people call them stable teams, and the idea is that these teams stay together. Now they might be on the periphery, one or two people coming, but the core of the teams always stay together, and we bring the work to the team. Make sense? Okay, so limit our work in process, create these stable teams, bring the work to the team. Who has something like this? Anybody? And you're, which, with, which company, sir? EMC, the data company? You recently got bought out by somebody? Dell, okay, how's it working out for you? No change, okay. So you have these kind of standing teams, and the teams stay together, so let's follow our uh, Dell model or the EMC model, which works really well. I think uh, Evan Leiborn, he talks about this as well. You know, this is a, a product-based model rather than a project-based model. Now, you can put projects together as necessary, but this one is really good for product development, right? Once we have these teams, let's combine them in a network. Can we scale them through what we call an agile PMO, right? Remember, we want to go from one stage the, the, 
if you have individual teams, can we now start to put together a structure? And I'm gonna show you one example, which is an Agile PMO. There are other scaling examples we'll talk about in a second in from, the, from the scaling frameworks. But let me show you. Oh, uh, I hope I don't have to do, oh, here we go, I'm glad. So this is a group called an Agile PMO. Let's watch them in action. Are there any other potential release changes that you need to do? Is that a green card movement? So is this, uh, Jill, is this represent the, the reconfigured board? Is this the consolidation? This is the consolidation, except I would say that everything from 417 is actually correct. This is not correct because we need we need more weeks over there. So let's I, don't, I don't have more board. Do we need, because uh, I'd like to take two minutes to talk about that, is do we need any further updates in the current iteration from any of the groups represented? Probably probably need to go through there. Yeah. Okay, so those people in that room were what we would call an agile program management office. And uh, we're going to see different names for it in second in the scaling frameworks. But what it meant was that you got one or two people from each team. You have one or two executives. The guy in the shirt was saying, I need two minutes to talk about that. He was an executive. And he was, ha he was organizing this group called the Lean Agile or the Agile Program Management Office. The lady who was near the board, she was this chief scrum master, the equivalent of what we would call in SAFE the release train engineer. Right, so if you have, some of you are familiar with SAFE, right? And so what they were doing in that meeting was they were managing cross-project dependencies. And so if you look at the board, it's what we would call a portfolio alignment wall or a program wall. Each column is a time box, the equivalent of a sprint. Each row are features moving through, and each card on those are high-level work products. The dots on each card, these dots, represent dependent teams. Right? Dependent teams, then they got a dot, we put a team up there, and by doing so, this is that particular program had 21 teams working in parallel. Four were agile teams, 17 of the teams were waterfall teams. And they were getting together and putting this wall together for the PMP folks, this is the equivalent of a master program schedule. Right? It's a program level de deliverable that's coordinating work across the different uh, projects, and they can lay it out and they see the results, okay? So that's, the, uh, that's coordinating work, managing the flow. Let's get back to Acme. After having done this, the result, spectacular, right? Time to market across, up by 40%, cost, up, cost down by 25%, and customer satisfaction up by 39%. Looking good, what do you think? All right, so they say, well, now let's reflect and progress and now we're ready to look at some of the scaling frameworks because we have built the foundation. We have some stable teams at the bottom level. We have some cross-team coordination through our Agile PMO. And now what we can do is we can start to look at the scaling frameworks. So they say, let's take an example. Who over here is familiar with the scaled Agile framework? So a lot of you guys know, are seeing. At the bottom level, all of those teams are Scrum or XP teams in, in the scaled Agile framework. This program level, what we call an Agile PMO, the coordination group is what? What do we call it in SAFE? An Agile release train or an art. And the chief scrum master, the lady who was in that video, what do we call her? A release train engineer, right? So we say we have built these blocks. SAFE has other things where you have an architectural runway and stuff. And once we have the program level elements, we can also pull together at the portfolio level, right? So um, if we wrap up, if we follow that approach, limiting the work in process, building out stable teams, creating that network of stable teams, and then looking forward, here are the options that we have. We have Scrum of Scrums, we have Agile PMO, the Spotify, and then the frameworks over there, uh, DAD, SAFE, Celeste, and Nexus. And the elements or the techniques that I've, um, uh, the elements of the techniques that I've showed is, um, of what you see on this on the screen over here, right? So summary and next steps, strategy, 
iterative strategy, incremental rollout, and your fundamentals to take forward. Reach in the book, reach in your bag, take your free book, and if you're a CTO, PMO lead, or Scrum Master team lead, this is what you need to do. So I think we're at time. What, uh, do we have any questions? How much time do we have? Five minutes time. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. Five minutes, two minutes. Which one? Okay. Okay, two minutes. Two minutes of questions. Any questions? We might not have any questions. Any questions? That's not my business. Okay, so uh, I think both the safe guys and the dad guys are here. So as a third party, what I've given you is a foundation that you can build on. We call it a jump start. Put these building blocks in place. And you know, I think uh, both the safe folks are there. I would like people to make an intelligent choice. Like uh, Scott Abler says, choice is good. I've given you the building blocks to make your own choice. Does that make sense? Right, let's take one more question and we'll done. I think people are waiting for the next speaker. Yes. So you see, uh, uh, my email address, uh, the website's over there, and make sure you read the book. Thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of the conference.